What is going on, Notre Dame fans? Mike Singer from BlueAndGold.com, joined by former Irish linebacker and captain Mike Goolsby. The people have been asking for Mike Goolsby, so we're bringing him on. Um, and uh, the, the former five-star recruit is with us. Um, appreciate you guys joining us live. Appreciate you guys watching back on YouTube, expecting a big show. Um, and Mike Goolsby has a lot of to say when it comes to Notre Dame football in this 2021 season after, um, you know, Notre Dame's first two wins combining uh, by winning just by six points, uh, 48 or 41, 38 overtime over Florida state 32, 29 over Toledo. Um, Mike, I, I will just kind of, I mean, we, we have things we want to talk about for sure. And we will get to questions from the YouTube chat. Of course, if you want your answer, if you want your question answered right away, just drop us a super chat. We are very easily bought. Um, but otherwise we have things we want to talk about, then we'll get to your questions later in the show. So Mike opening statement, what do you got? It feels th this season thus far feels eerily similar to, uh, the early part, maybe the first quarter of last season. Um, we all kind of remember that Louisville game, which is a little bit further down the road. I mean, I think we were in October for that kind of turd of a game. Um, but we've seen these these clunky kind of starts before uh, we're not super efficient we don't look like what we would all expect a Notre Dame team to look like um, there's some growing pains you know we're breaking in a new quarterback new you know new to us anyway and breaking in a new defensive coordinator he's trying to see what kids can do and what they can't do um, but it's yeah it's not ideal and then like and Florida State loses yesterday to Jackson State, and it's just like, gosh, man. And, you know, we dropped in the polls today, probably deservedly so. Uh, but we've been here before. Uh, last year ended up being a success um, for all intents and purposes. So not not it's probably a little bit premature to start freaking out, but it's okay to be upset. I am. Um, I'm sure a lot of us are. But uh, we're, two, we're two games in, so there's – I just I feel like there's um, probably some more like glaring deficiencies this year than there was last year. Um, last year there's probably a little bit more reason to be optimistic than there is right now. So that's probably the biggest difference. But we're two games in. Uh, we're two and zero. Oh. Um, but there's yeah there's some again there's some there's some holes that really stick out. What are some holes, Mike? What are some well the holes? offensive line? I mean the offensive line. <laughs> Uh, this is O-line U. It's supposed to be anyway. We're down to our third string tackle and we're starting a true freshman, which you would think is less than ideal. And Blake Fisher's a special kid, special athlete. Um, but yeah, the offensive line, and we'll definitely get into this, folks, is a huge issue. Um, in the defense, which is so ironic, Mike, because everybody was stoked you know, we lost Clark Lee, but shoot, I mean, who, who, who better to replace him than Marcus Freeman? And we were all fired up for that. Uh, he's done a hell of a job as a recruiter. So, you know, there's two parts to being a college coach. I mean, um, acquiring talent and then, you know, scheming them up, um, coaching them up, developing them. So the scheme is like super problematic. Um, and we'll, again, we'll get into this too, Mike, but um, off the bat, those are the two holes. And then I guess maybe, if that's one, one A and two A, and then maybe a, the, the third hole would be like, do we have a quarterback controversy? You know, it's like, gosh, are we ever going to stop talking about Notre Dame's quarterback position? But you bring in Jack Cohn for some stability, and you know, the pundits and the, the the broadcast team and Coach Kelly clearly loves to talk about his calm demeanor, and um, so this is going to be exciting frankly, as a fan to watch how this quarterback, I don't know if you know, we, if we can call it a competition at this point, but to see how that unfolds. Yeah, definitely. So uh, Notre Dame two and O dropping in the polls. Um, I mean, the, you, you mentioned feels similar to the start of last season. I've seen a lot of people talk about this is similar to the start of the 2016 season when that was, of course, when Notre Dame went four and eight, um, had that, you know, uh, the Texas is back game where the Irish lost and, Texas stunk that year. Notre Dame stunk. Um, I, I've seen people compare it to 2018 when Notre Dame had a, a good win against Michigan. 
um, where they went up big early and then let them back in the game, eerily similar to the Michigan 2018 game. And then Ball State, I believe, was the next week and barely beat a MAC team. That sounds like this year. But, Mike, yeah. that 2018 team went to the college football playoffs, got its doors blown off by Clemson. But um, 2020 team, you know, struggled against Louisville, like you mentioned. Um, you know, Duke in the first week, you know, 14 point win at home. I mean, do you think that this team can really rebound and, and, and turn the corner? I mean, have you seen enough at this point to, to make that assessment? The hope is yes. We, I mean, we have, we have better players and this is, uh, we're going to jump into some of these topics here, but maybe this is a segue, but like we have better players than, I don't know, 85, 90, 95% of the teams that we're going to face. Like that's at this point we do like Kevin Austin looks totally legit. Uh, obviously we got great backs. You got a bunch of four or five star offensive linemen. Um, same can be said for the defense. Our front four is exceptional. We've got great talent, you know, and I'm kind of, and part of my job here, Mike, I feel like is to, uh, I want to say things that kind of carry some weight and maybe give people different perspective. And in doing so, I always try to do it as a, I mean, I just turned 39 two days ago and I Happy feel birthday. closer to being, oh, thanks buddy. I feel closer to being like a 19 year old Notre Dame football player than I almost do like closer to 40 in terms of how I look at this, look at this. But like when you look at, when you compare this season in particular to last season, we had some kind of clunky games early on. You're playing lesser opponents, Duke and Louisville, you're playing them at home, like early ish in the season. And that's a real thing as an ex player. I can kind of remember what that was like to be playing at home in the game day atmosphere at Notre Dame. It's not what it was for a night game at Florida State, right? Com two completely different environments, two completely different animals. And for like a Toledo, it's a overused, you know, phrase, but like it is their Super Bowl. So they, I mean, they play out of their minds. And sometimes it's hard for those day games at home for kids to get up. You're on a little bit of a short week. It's not an excuse, but it is a real thing having, you know, played there before. So, um, yes, you can turn it around. The offensive line is going to be the, the biggest issue because uh, as an offense, you have to create an identity. Last year, our identity was, you know, leaning on that running game. Kyron Williams is like a big budding star. Um we haven't really seen the productivity um, as, as him as like a classic running back. You know, he's had some success as like a, you know, all purpose yards, catching the ball, et cetera. But um, at this point, if we can't get the offensive line sorted out, um, it's, it's going to be sticky. It's really like, I mean, if we don't get that offensive line figured out here soon, Wisconsin's going to kick our ass. Yeah. Like for all our sports betters out there, I assume Wisconsin will be favored, um, but I mean, they have the potential the way that they play defense and just they're super sound. Um, I mean, they have the potential to, to kick our ass for sure. So it's got to get short up here quick. Yeah, definitely. We've got a super chat from Hond, uh, also a member of our blue and gold.com message board. He really wanted to, uh, to drop us a super chat. So Hond, if you got a question for Mr. Goolsby, um, uh, yeah, sure. fire it out. Yeah, fired up. So um, definitely appreciate you guys watching us live. Uh, like I said earlier, we got things that we want to talk about, but we also want to get your questions and what you want uh, to discuss. So if you want to have us answer your question right away, drop us a super chat very easily bought. Um, so yeah, like Kelly Kirk says, it's nice to hear from great linebacker played at Notre Dame and gets it. So we're going to talk all things. Um, start a Notre Dame season. What is next with Mike Goolsby? Man, let's let's start with the quarterbacks. Um, Please. Let's dive into it. If you're Brian Kelly, and you know what? Screw that. If you're Mike Goolsby, head coach of Notre Dame football, what are you doing? Like, let, I don't want you to put yourself in Brian Kelly's shoes because then you're going to think, all right, well, this is what I think Kelly would do. But what would you do? Jack Cohn, Tyler Buckner, is it a two-quarterback system? Hell, are you doing a three-quarterback system with Drew Pine? <laughs> what are you doing, Mike? At this point in the in the coming weeks, um, I'm probably going to switch them, maybe kind of a 50-50 type split um, because Buckner, realistically, I mean, I, I was shocked to see him roll out there. And I think it was anticipated that he was, you know, within like the N ND inner circles that he was going to get some PT. Uh, but for a kid that's played as 
little football as he has previously, it was very surprising to see him out there. But going forward, you've got to get him, Tyler, caught up in terms of the system. Cohen's a good player, but he did get beat out at Wisconsin, right? And the expectation or the ask. Sort of. Or, 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 sort of. Okay. He well, got hurt, but yeah, continue. So he got, you know, what is it, Wally Pipped? But uh, – I mean, the expectation for a quarterback at Wisconsin is it's that kind of that dirty word or that dirty term as a game manager. And then I was thinking about, you know, in lieu of our our time tonight, Mike, I was thinking about just this question, Cone versus Buckner. And, you know, Notre Dame's a great program, and we get to these big-time games against the Bamas, the Ohio States, the Clemsons. And then who do we end up, like, losing to? We lose to, like, like first-round draft pick, shoot Heisman trophy winning first pick overall type quarterbacks, right? We just do. And Ian book wasn't on par with that. Those, those types athletically, like the Trevor Lawrence's of the world. Um, Buckner, maybe hmm. in terms of like he, his skill set. I mean, he threw a ball, his second pass, first pass was a deep ball. was incomplete. His second pass. He threw to the opposite hash and just whipped that ball out there. And then Jack Cohn got a, had a pick six on a similar type throw. The ball was a little bit inside. It just didn't have the zip to get there. So the ceiling for Cone, or excuse me, for Tyler Buckner is much, much higher than Cone. And for this season? Because I obviously for the career, but do you think for this season? Uh yeah. Yeah. And then this then so this is I asked you before we went live, Mike, to keep me on track. So please do. Yeah, I got but you. like if the off- if the offensive line doesn't get their act together, you're going to need a Tyler Buckner back there to just create yeah. some things with his legs like we've seen with Ian Book. Now, I'll say this too. In regards to his running game, folks, go back and watch Tyler Buckner's like high school highlight tape. He literally looked he carries the ball like a running back. Like he's shifty, you know, he hits that R2 L2 button if we're playing Madden like those side jump cuts. Um and this is his first game in a couple years. He's at Notre Dame Stadium. He's a true freshman. Tyler Buckner can actually be a better um, runner than he was yesterday. I think like some of that play anxiety and things like he wasn't as shifty as like you've seen him be in, in high school, obviously level competition is different, but there's much, he's got, that kid's got moves. He's got speed and he's got some, right. some wiggle to him. So, um, but you know, going back and looking at Jones or excuse me, Jack Cohen's work over the first two games, like he's not comfortable. This is just my notes. He's not comfortable throwing the ball to his left. Um, I think he has like a limited arm strength. You saw the Hail Mary attempt at the end of the first half against Toledo. Ball, and I know you're trying to put some arc on the ball, but the ball barely made it 50 yards. He seems like when a guy, like when you look at a guy like that, throw the ball, has small-ish hands, he almost like pushes it. So yeah, the ceiling for, for Buckner is much higher than Cone. And I, I just think with, with the offensive line being like as leaky as it is, you might need him to... Uh, to create some, some magic with his legs. And then the other point, sorry, Mike, no, no the other point is dude, this offense thus far is like, you know, a little bit inside run, a lot of stretch plays to the outside, a lot of RPO stuff. So Jack Cohn as a defensive end, or as it even as a defensive coordinator game planning against Notre Dame, Jack Cohn doesn't scare you on an RPO, right? So you can devote more bodies, right? I mean, I can leave a, uh, he's not going to juke out a defensive end, right? So like when, when Tyler Buckner is running that same play, you're going to slow down the inside linebackers in terms of the pursuit of the running back. Like, so it's going to help the running game traditionally in terms of putting the ball in Kyren or Tyree's hands. So that's a, that's a plus for Buckner. Um, and then the other thing, man, Jack Cohn threw a pick six. Like, it's not like he's Tom Brady back there, right? Like he were unseating Tom Brady. So he's not infallible. And then the last point that I really wanted to make was, um, the offense thus far, man, inside run, outside stretch plays, and it's th- throw the ball to, to Michael Mayer. That's our that's our offense right now. So can Tyler Buckner not just throw the ball to the tight end? It's not like we're making these complicated reads, et cetera. Like, dude, 50% of our attempts go to the go to one guy. Hmm. So I don't think uh, you're just scheming Michael Mayer open up to this point, and I think Tyler Buckner can execute that. I really do. Okay few things one on the <laughs> on the floor i'll see if i can remember some of these on the floor ceiling talk the 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 floor for cone is much higher like there's no doubt about it right i mean like 
talking about the worst Cone can be versus the worst Buckner could be, talking about a true freshman and a fifth-year senior, um, that's that's for sure. Cone on the arm strength, yeah, he's had some duds up there for sure. He had a dud against Florida State too. Like it like, limits the it limits the offense. But he had a couple of th- throws this season. The, the um man, they're they're escaping me. I think it was the touchdown to Kevin Austin. He had another really nice one. <laughs> Might have been another one to Austin in the Florida State game where it's like, whoa, that is an element in this Notre Dame offense that we didn't have last season. So I'll ask. Well, let's you, jump. Okay, go ahead. So it's like we didn't have it last season. And again, I'm going to root for Notre Dame's quarterback, whether it's Ian Book or whomever, right? Um, so don't kill me for that. But we didn't see sometimes the ball being pushed because Ian wouldn't pull the trigger, right? So Cohen's willing to pull the trigger and deliver the ball. But now you're talking about the zip on it, uh, throwing into windows, etc. So I'm just... And then, like, there, there's another element, too. This is going to be an interesting, like, locker room thing that yeah. this can of worms that Kelly may have potentially opened up, and maybe it'll end up being a good thing. But the dudes in the team know, man. Like, they know, right? So, like, they got a little bit of taste of Buckner, went three for three, runs the ball, created maybe 150 yards of total offense himself. Um, and Cohen's just kind of, like, vanilla. And I've heard it – Ad nauseum, Cone is a steady, calm leader, and there's different ways to lead. And so when Tyler Buckner comes in the game, he like he's smiling, dude. And that resonates hmm. through a sideline and it resonates through a locker room because this is a game. Um, and that energy can be really contagious in terms of the team dynamic. So if, if it's it, like we were flat, you know, we were flat against Toledo until that kid comes in the game on the freaking – backed up on the four yard line and makes a hell of a play. Right. So that's going to be another interesting thing. If you keep rolling cone out, there may be a little bit of uh, dissension in that locker room because guys real recognizes real Mike. I mean, you know that. Yeah. I recognize real right now. Okay. Keeping things real. That's why you bring on Mike Goolsby. Well, here's something for you. So do you think Tyler Buckner, I mean, you, you start him. Okay. Side note, something kind of I'm ironic. I'm not saying you start him. I'm okay, not saying right. you start him. Right, okay. So, the things that Jack Cohn can do and the things that Tyler Buckner can do, if you form that into one quarterback, it's kind of Ian Book, right? Like, it feels like Notre Dame right now misses Ian Book because you have this leaky offensive line and you have that leadership and, and all that good stuff that Cohn brings. Ian Book had that. And then the athleticism... Um, Ian Book had that, so I, I find that kind of funny. But okay, you you bring up good, interesting points. The locker room. Um, so if you're in that locker room, like if if Mike Goolsby, and of course you were in that locker room, you play for Notre Dame. If you were in that team right now, what would you want? I mean, would would you be more fired up to have Tyler Buckner as your quarterback? And I'm not trying to start shit or anything. Pardon my French, but like, is is that how you would feel? I mean, would you? have more juice playing for Buckner or is it like you look you're you're a Mike linebacker doesn't matter uh the first time I heard you cuss on air Mike good for you um hope I don't get canceled I think you'll be fine I think um as like and as an ex-captain type in that locker you're room right? I think you it's a little bit premature to go ahead and start Buckner right we need nuance in our lives okay so there's going to be some nuance to this but I think if you put a kid in that has the ability and the energy and it's like, wow, right? So we, you want upside. I mean, you want upside, all the things that he can do. From a locker room perspective, I would hope that like the leaders and all the different units, whether it's the, the, the defensive backs and the offensive line in particular, like you have to step your game up to, to ease that transition for Tyler. Does that make sense to you? Sure. So it's like, okay, I have to do a little bit more. I have to – because I have to do, I, I can see the, the, the potential here. I can see what this kid could be. And I got to do a little bit more on my end. Whereas with Jack Cohen, I don't think you, you feel that a, a level of excitement. And plus, I mean, Jack Cohen transferred in, right? So he's not like one of us. He hasn't been through the ups and downs and all the workouts over the last three, four years, right? Like, so um, he hasn't maybe earned that level of, 
he has, hasn't earned that kind of, I'm not respect. I'd hate to use that word. Um, but it's like, he's an outsider coming into play. Yeah. So all of those things kind of balled into it, Mike, it's a, uh, it'll be, again, it's going to be fun to watch, but in terms of our going back to the X's and O's of this, our offense is throw the ball to Michael Mayer. We take a couple deep shots. Buckner's got a stronger arm. And then with that RPO stuff, he's going to slow down a defense because he's almost as equal of a threat as one of our tailbacks toting the pill versus him keeping it. Whereas if Cohen's in the game, there is really no threat of him pulling the ball. It's just, it. Yeah. So. Well, for Notre Dame's sake, I mean, you got Purdue this weekend and then uh, it's a brutal stretch. Um, Wisconsin on the 25th. Um, and then what? Cincinnati, Virginia Tech, I mean, UNC, USC in October. <laughs> it's, it's a brutal stretch. So they hope they get that figured out. All right. We had that uh, super chat from Hond. Here's his question. Um, so Notre Dame lost uh, Marist Lou Fowl um, and uh, Paul Moala, a couple linebackers for the season. So Han asked, what does losing your starting middle linebacker right before the first game of your season due to the continuity of the defense? And luckily, Notre Dame has its mic. And then J.D. Bertrand's really emerged. But, you know, how long, Han says, how long does it take for the communication to develop? In this, in this instance, longer than you would hope because you brought in your new defensive coordinator in terms of, so there's maybe three strings, first string, second string, third string are going to get meaningful reps at a, in a practice and then week like during the uh, a game week only ones and twos get reps so with bringing in coach freeman one can assume that marist was getting the lion's share of those reps trying to learn that scheme so then you know your backups behind him um weren't getting as many so it, the, the way that we the way that we play our linebackers is like frustrating and fascinating at, at times and it's like i mean the way Bertrand's playing, dude. Like, I almost feel like you could plug him in at Mike at times, and I feel like you could. Prince Kali wasn't available for the Toledo game, but like, why not just pull? If we're just gonna blitz these dudes, I'd much rather have Prince bringing the noise than some other guys on a roster. Like, just you could maybe put him in for spot duty if we're just calling a blitz. Like, hey, bro, you go in the, on these ten snaps, and you're just bringing it. So go be an athlete. So there's a lot of interchangeability, but yes, it, it would the, the continuity. And the communication uh, in this instance with co- with a new defensive coordinator, new scheme coming in, probably took longer than you'd like. Yeah. So last thing on the quarterbacks, um, unless we have a super chat coming in, um, I mean, it's, it's certainly going to be interesting this week. And you know how much the media is asked is this? A, do they bring up the controversy word, a battle? Um, so you, how much are you going to play? Buckner this week you know like should he I mean against Toledo I feel like and I can't speak for the coaches on this but they were going to play him I don't think they thought that they were going to need him to win the freaking football game I thought they were just going to kind of throw him in there if he's the guy next season I believe it's Ohio State they start the season with so if he's going to be the starter you want to have experience for him this year so I like that plan but now it seems like with this leaky offensive line, you need him to win football games. Uh, and and Cone, Cone created the, uh, committed the cardinal sin. Like he threw a pick six. So that's a huge black eye kind of on his, I guess, resume. So Buckner went three for three. I mean, <laughs> so... Uh, and it goes back to like my initial approach in terms of like winning big time college football games, dude. And how our seasons have ended so many years now where we lose to stud quarterbacks. Um, and Buckner may not have like, he's not a, might be lacking in a little bit of height, but uh, he's a stud quarterback. Like he's a five-star type stud quarterback. He's not a Drew Pine. He's not an Ian Book. Um, you know, Dracovic was the closest thing in terms of like just sheer talent um, to Buckner that we've seen in like recent years, but it's going to take a player like that to win some of those big time games against, you know, special kids. Like they've got a special kid. We need to have a special kid and maybe you start that grooming process now, but I do think it will be kind of a, I hope, honestly, man, I hope it's like a 50, 50 deal for the next 
couple okay. weeks and then maybe see more. All right. So comment from Daniel Wade. I truly hope that everyone can get behind playing both quarterbacks. There doesn't need to be a quarterback controversy. Let's just support doing what will put us in the uh, best position to keep winning. That sounds fantastic in theory, but this is the quarterback position as like great of a young man and um, like a team guy as Jack Cohn is like he like there's no way that he can't like lose some confidence if he's a fifth year guy who won the job in fall camp and now the third string, you know, I guess he's third string on paper. He's, you know, he, he if, if Cohn were to go down, it, it's, it's Buckner's offense, I believe, but. Um, the pine at number two just kind of seems like um, a, a nod. We see it. Yeah, we see it. Yeah, there's no controversy. And again, I'm pulling for Jack Cohen. And again, I pulled through Ian Book through through it all, right? The ups and downs. And But like, I like to use NFL analogies sometimes, Mike, and every single year you see it. Some team has a veteran quarterback and then they draft the kid early in the first round. And like, it's inevitable before the talent wins out and the upside wins out. And that's the coach's job to, you don't want to scar a young player. Like you don't want to throw him to the wolves per se. Um, so he gets, you know, trigger, trigger shy, but um, talent wins out, man, or at least it should. All right. Let's stick with the offensive side of the ball, the offensive line. Um, yeah. Fisher going down. That's a, a major problem eight weeks um, that, you know, so he won't be available until later in the season. Um, and then, you know, Michael Carmody uh, uh, performed admirably, but then str still struggled. Then he goes down. Tosh Baker goes in um, at left tackle, you know, Kane Madden, the Marshall transfer at right guard, you know, he struggled, you know, the, the O-line has just not been great. Uh, heck, it hasn't been good or Heck, it probably hasn't even been average. What are you seeing from the O-line, and is it fixable? I mean, do you shift guys around? Do you roll with what you have and, and just hope that you can improve them this week in practice? I don't know, Mike. What, what, what's your take on the O-line? Yeah, I've never and I've never pretended to be an offensive line expert, but some of these, like, and I'm talking left tackle specifically. I'll leave individual players out of it, but you see, like, a, a pass set, right, Mike? So, like, and I've trained offensive linemen, but to me, it's like I talk about being on a train track. You're going forward and you're going back, right? You almost don't come off that track where sometimes we see guys setting out too wide and they open up for an inside rush. Both Karma, uh, Car Carmody uh, and uh, Baker, I've seen them like get off the ball late. Like, they, like they're almost not hearing the snap count or something where they're just – they're a half a second late. It's been ugly. I mean, and then some of these, like, I, I, the strength of our, our offense offense in terms of running the ball, it seems, thus far, and it was the same last year, dude, is, like, run it downhill. Run it downhill. Not these, like, sweeping plays where you're asking guys to, like, a guard, like Madden, to, to get a piece of the inside guy, and then he's got to climb to the second level. It just doesn't work. And Kyron's been awesome in terms of trying to just make it make it work and – being patient and just picking up three, four yards when he can. He's been exceptional at that. But you got to run the ball downhill. Can you fix it? We like to operate out of 11 personnel. And preseason, I was hoping we'd work up more out of 12. So maybe you're going to you're gonna have to leave a, a tight end in to chip uh, a little bit. And it probably won't be Merrick because he'll be maybe split out wide. But you might have to leave a, a tight end, again, just to chip and maybe leak out late on a route. Yeah. In, in, in the uh, – in the short term, Fisher played great. You could see, and I remember when I was actually a player and the little bit of time I spent in the NFL, some of those dudes in the NFL are so big, Mike, that like they're standing in front of you. Like, how do I even get around this person? Cause they're so big. And that's Fisher. Yeah. Fisher had like some conditioning issues, which is totally understandable. It's almost acceptable for a young kid like him. I'm a little concerned when he comes back cause he has such a big goo. He's heavy. Um, if he if he isn't able to to work out and move around during the course of this eight weeks, um, he might need a couple weeks to kind of ease back in, uh, just because he looked out of t he looked tired during the Florida State game. A lot of kids a lot of kids did our best player John Mayer or excuse me uh, Michael Mayer. <laughs> he, lo he, he looked nice. uh, he looked tired, but um, so it's yeah it's not going to be a quick fix, but schematically maybe you have to leave a guy in to chip yeah and then go from there. I man, 
Kelly, uh, Kelly wants to stick with it. But if I'm a quarterback, um, and, and this is just my two cents, take it for what it's worth. I, I want my blind side protected. And I, I, um, it's your third string left tackle, or maybe not uh, third choice of left tackle, even, you know, yeah. like I, I feel like I'd move it around. And a lot of people have said, move Jarrett Patterson, the center to left tackle. How often in football do you ever see a center move to left tackle? Kelly basically said in this post-game press conference, like, look, I just don't think Jarrett Patterson's a tackle body. Like, uh, that that's not his skill set. I would. Yeah. So, I mean, tra- traditionally, I mean, you could, you, and he, yeah, Kelly in his press conference talked about, like, it's a personnel issue. But in terms of fixes, like football 101, you got to move the pocket, right? So, right. especially if you're having, both of our quarterbacks are right-handed, I believe. So, yes. I mean, you're going to have to you're going to have to kind of sink that left tackle and then maybe roll Buckner out, which plays to his game, and or you know Cone. You got to move the pocket, or you got to leave an additional blocker into chip. Mike, I'm going to switch out my earbuds yep. here, buddy. All right, yep, go ahead. And uh, we have a super chat from Daniel Wade, so we really uh, appreciate that. His question is, um, uh, why? Okay, here, here's another question from him. I don't understand Notre Dame not getting up for every game. You have the golden helmet. You're at Notre Dame. Why do these kids come out flat? And I'll even kind of add, you know, is this – how much credit do you give to Toledo? You know, returning 20 to 21 starters. Um, and, um, you know, we lost Mr. Goolsby. Um, so we'll bring him back here in, uh, in, in just a minute. Um, sometimes when he switches his, his AirPods, um, we lose connection. So – I, I think, Daniel, I'll give my two cents real quick. I think part of it is you have to give Toledo some credit. Like, they are still a good Mac football team. Uh, and Notre Dame got the win when they were playing, what, C-minus ball? Uh, that was, you know, far from Notre Dame's best ball. Um, and they still came out with the win. I think you really like what you see in that last drive. Uh, on uh, Jack Cohn's touchdown uh, pass to Mare to win the game, Um I think he showed a lot. Um, I, I mean, with the with, with the finger issue and um, and and then you know throwing that game and touchdown. Tosh Baker had a pancake on that play. So, all right, Mike, um, can you hear me? You back in? I'm back with you, Mike. Right. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. So, question. You know, don't understand Notre Dame not getting up for every game. You have the golden helmet. You're at Notre Dame. Why do these kids come out flat? How much credit do you give towards Toledo for this? What are your thoughts, Mike? I touched on this earlier, right? And I'm going to be trying to be very smart with my words here, but let it loose. Let like, your hair, let yeah, your, dude, dude, uh, let your dude, hair hang. Day low. games, day games at Notre Dame, like, sleepy. And then again, that's what you said. Yeah. Where well, you come out sleepy, like we have to go to class, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And like you wake up and like, you're going to mass before a game and I'm 18 years in Catholic school. Right. I like a, a nice mass, but. It's like I'm in mass. Guys are asleep during mass. Like it just is what it is. And then you walk to the stadium, and then Notre Dame's crowd isn't in during the Kelly area. They've done a lot in terms of like music and done a lot of the, you know, people were against the jumbotron, right? Because it's like anti-tradition. Now they play music during the games. They do what they can, but some of that's on the crowd. I mean, it just is. Um, it's hard to get up for a day game at Notre Dame Stadium. Sometimes it just it just is. Um, and it's a balance, right? Because it's like some of this stuff is, is sacred. These traditions and things are sacred, but like this, we're also going to kick ass and play football. So it's like, how do I respect the traditions and all these things, but then get up to play a Toledo who's been some of these dudes on Toledo's team have had this game circled for you know, three years. Right. So there's something that I don't, if I had the, you know, the magic potion or whatever, but it's just the game day environment. It's awesome, especially during the fall and all of that. But I'm talking about you got to go out here and bang heads. And sometimes like the environment's just not conducive to that. All right, let's move in, in, on to talking about your side of the ball. And again, appreciate the uh, super chat, Daniel Wade. Um, you know, if anyone wants their questions uh, answered right away, drop super chat. We're easily bought. And uh, make sure you hit that thumbs up. Where's my th- there it is. Thumbs up on this video. Uh, help support what we're doing here if you're not able to uh, drop super chat. So, um, let's talk defense. Marcus Freeman, he is, you know, hailed the greatest thing uh, since sliced bread in the offseason. 
I was very much on the Marcus Freeman hype train, but said like, like, you know, it's fantastic as a recruiter, but I was like, look guys, once Florida state gets a field goal or first down or whatever, like you guys are gonna be like fired Marcus Freeman and, um, you know, kind of joking, but uh, shoot, I don't know if I've seen fire Marcus Freeman, but it's like comparing him to, to Van Gorder, uh, you know, the, the former Notre Dame defensive coordinator. Do you have thoughts on people making that comparison? What do, what do you thought about Marcus Freeman two games in? The scheme, like, kind of sucks, dude. It kind of, like, I've never, whether it's Marcus Freeman's, Freeman scheme or Van Gorder's scheme, the, a three-man front can work in the NFL because, like, you have the bodies for it. Uh, the three-man front, toss it out. I said earlier, we've got better players than 90% of the teams we play, maybe 95% of the teams we're going to play. And I think that's true. So, like, at some point, bro, you just line up and play. It's like put four hands in the dirt. I, You know, like, why is J.D. Bertrand, who's our most aggressive downhill um, best linebacker up to this point, like, he's, like, by a, a long shot in terms of productivity. The kid's got three tackles for loss. Playing that will spot as a backup, right? Like, he's subbing in for Marist. Um, and he's, like, 12 yards off the ball, Isaiah Foskey, who's a first round draft pick type guy. I don't know what his career sacks are, but he's special. He has three thus far this year. And we're moving him into the box to play middle linebacker. It's, some of the stuff just doesn't make sense. And having, I played in a three, four in the NFL, like, you know, my little cup of coffee and with Dallas, um, three, four is hard to play as an inside linebacker. Cause it's like trying to think of an analogy. It's like, you're going down a, a street going 90 miles an hour and you get to a fork in a road and you have to make a decision. So it's like, and you have to make your defensive lineman, right? So if my defensive end pokes his head outside, I have to be inside, but at the last minute he's two gap and he jumps back inside. I have to make him right. Um, and you've got guards rolling off on you. It's just playing in a three man front. It's super susceptible to getting gashed. It just does. And the front four of our team of our defense is the strength at this yep. point. It, like by again a long shot, so dude, just line up and play. Um, and there's there, again with the with the nuance, Mike. We're down there in like the tight red zone, right? They're on the whatever it is, six seven yard line going in, and we're bringing heat. So then you're you're leaving your corners on an island. And my philosophy would be to do the complete opposite in that like flood the passing lane. So we're gonna put more bodies and and try and make this kid throw throw through all these bodies and just let my front four go to work. So. It's a cute scheme. Uh, everybody loves to be aggressive, but if this is big time football, Mike, if, if, if one guy gets kind of knocked out of a gap, I mean, I saw, I think it was uh, Jack Kaiser came like free as a bird on a blitz up the middle and they just trapped him and they just blew him out, right? So he got penetration and he got caught up in a trap. So um, to me, it's not it's not sexy, but sometimes you just line up and play and let your dogs eat, which we, we have some dogs with our front four. I don't know if this is the right kind of example to bring up, but I think about like when the Giants would beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl, what they do, the four great D linemen, go get Tom Brady, um, pressure him, and you're not bringing extra guys um, most of the time because you know you have such great – pressure you don't need to blitz more guys so Notre Dame secondary you know Kyle Hamilton's great you know Griffith is a good player Clarence Lewis Cam Hart they're they're good DBs but you need you need to help them okay I think we're back live I don't know what happened but we cut out it's a, yeah we got 91 people we lost we lost about 100 people but yeah I think we're back live all right well we're we're back what were we talking about? Defense? We we're talking about defense scheme kind of philosophy in that, like, we're leaving our secondary out to – hanging them out to dry at times. And yep. The, so the football 101 is, like, you play zone defense so that we as defenders can keep our eyes on a quarterback and you might create more turnovers that way, right, because we could read the quarterback's eyes. So in the, the, the flip side of that is you play a lot of man and you bring uh, heat, right? So – there's again there's nuance to this stuff so like it's okay to switch it up just because your mo or your identity is to bring these complex blitz schemes like it doesn't mean you need to like do it 95 percent of the times like you can mix mix it up i and i hate mike 
this double A gap mug tech, they call it like a mug technique, or they used to back in the day. Nebraska used to do it back in the day when I was on the scout team at Notre Dame playing Nebraska in 2000, 2001. Um, so like you walk your inside linebackers up and then one end up ends up coming and it's just, it's kind of whack. It's like, you might as well just blitz them, right? So why not just leave them four yards off the ball and just blitz them? So that doesn't really make sense to me. Um, but yes, I wrote down shades of Brian Van Gorder in terms of sometimes you're trying to do too much or being being cute. I hate our best pass rusher being in the box. I hate your most productive downhill linebacker in Bertrand being walked out 15 yards in coverage. That doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and yeah, it's uh, and like and again, Drew White. I like Drew White. He's a captain, so you can't like necessarily demote him. But I, I swear, sometimes I feel like you could slide Bertrand into playing Mike, and you could put Collie at will, especially if we're just bringing blitzes. Because I think Bertrand would be a, I, I think that'd be a kind of fun mix to sort of play with. I really do. Um, but yeah, the front four has played exceptional, exceptional, and there's depth there. Just rotate dudes through, and you kind of just get back to a more traditional style of football. And then, like, la lastly, Mike, it was at the end of the game, you know, Toledo played a few different quarterbacks. Uh, they've got their athlete quarterback, and then we, we gave up a touchdown run to the – and that, like, that was blatantly obvious. Um, and Bertrand did what he could on that play, but there was nobody else. Like, he takes on a puller, and then the other guys are blitzing. So, like, why would you blitz with that quarterback in the game? It's blatantly obvious that he's going to keep the ball and run, Right. So we bring all this pressure and then Bertrand gets over the top and he's trying to force the ball back into somebody. And there's nobody there because everybody left on a blitz. That, that was poor to me. That was poor. All right. Last thing on the defense. Uh, again, sure. Unless somebody drops a super chat, we'll, we'll take it. But is this more of a Marcus Freeman doesn't have his guys thing? I mean, is it a personnel thing? What is, what is it? Is it? I think that's a, a weak argument. I mean, at his, I mean, with the exception of like Ohio State, some of his previous stops, I mean, he's got better talent here than he did at Cincinnati. So there might be a, like a level of comfort in terms of like guys having been in his scheme and understanding some of the intricacies of like maybe blitz angles and timing things, et cetera. But no, I don't think it's a, our defense is, is really, really strong. I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's that. It's just, it's that boomer ball. Bust. It's just boom or bust. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I would need to see the like the statistics in terms of the defensive statistics is two games into the season. Who has or where of all this? Where's all the sack production come from? Has it come from linebackers or has it just come from our traditional front four? So if we're not getting home with linebackers, um, then just again, this, let's just play a little bit more of a vanilla defense because you have pretty outstanding, uh, at least in the front seven. And um, I like the way our corners have played, guys. Um, but they're, they're put in some super tough, super difficult positions uh, up to this point. Yeah. So, And we do have a super chat, uh, so we appreciate this, from Anthony. He says, I'm confident Freeman will adapt to big boy football 2-0 and with huge mistakes and a first-year defensive coordinator solid and builds confidence and gives coaches leverage to push. Freeman will adapt. Right, Mike? Well, I think we've talked about this before, Mike, in terms of coaches and their egos. It's a, it's a very real thing, having been around coaches for a, my whole life, right? So – if Freeman's made a name for himself with that attacking style defense and uh, being unpredictable and, you know, being creative with his schemes and things like if it's not working, that might hurt your ego a little bit, but like, yeah, just dial it back and just play like a standard, you know, four, two, four, three, however he wants to, to phrase it. And just like let JD, Ber JD Bertrand and let Drew White just play off of their instincts. Right. You don't need to bring them. Uh, so, is he going to be willing to adapt? Sometimes that comes down to the ego to me. And I think sometimes, gosh, Mike, this is one of those things. I hope it makes sense. So with, with Clark Lee, I sometimes think like Shane Simon's a great example. Drew White's a really, uh, a fine example. And that like, maybe they're overcoached 
and it slows them down a little bit. They don't let their, you know, what hang and just come downhill and black people. Whereas Freeman philosophically is like, you guys let your hair down and come downhill and go make plays. And that's why you're seeing Bertrand do what he's doing. He had three TFLs yesterday. It's awesome. Um, so you can have the philosophy of let your hair down and be aggressive and go play without having to pull the trigger and send them on blitzes all the time. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, Mike. Um, this is something I, you know, have talked about um, since the the game ended yesterday. Would you rather go eight and four regular season um, with Tyler Buckner, um, eight and four with Tyler Buckner, or uh, or or ten and two with uh, Jack Cohen, and we'll leave out the bowl game because you know you, you don't have a lot of control over what bowl you get really, unless you're in the I'll play ball. along. Okay, go ahead. I'll play along, right? Because there's when you play these, you know, what if games and what, you know, I'll play along. Are we going ten and two, and I have access of like I, I have access to to Buckner, but Cohen's our starter. Sorry, I said I no, wouldn't do this, good, and I'm doing a, it. That's a good point. Um, he's he's yeah. kind of like Tebow with that Florida team, you know, kind of like a goal line, you know, short yard. So, Chris, so, 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 so Cohen is our Chris leak and uh, Cohen is our T uh, Buckner. Buckner's Cohen Tebow. is our Chris leak, but Buckner is our Tebow. Um, this year I would want to go 10 and two and have Cohen be the leader. And I say this because Ohio state's breaking in a new quarterback. Bama's breaking in a new quarterback and Clemson kind of has a new quarterback. So if this, if there was a year um, to like win it, just based off of the three things I just mentioned, um, you'd, you'd want, you would want the quarterback that gives you the best chance to win. So, I mean, part of me was thinking, well, gosh, if we lose to Toledo, then you can just maybe let Buckner go out there and, and learn kind of on the fly. Right. So, in, yeah, so that I, I think that I, I tried yeah. to answer your question. Yeah, I, I just it, this was something a lot going into the season. I would see fans, a, a lot of YouTube comments. It's like just punt this season. Like it, we we just it, it, Notre Dame fans. It's just like speaking for Notre Dame fans, or some I should say. It's like we don't care about ten and two anymore. We're like we, we've experienced that. We know where we're at. Give me seven and five this year if it means a better chance for winning a national championship under Buckner. Like I'll take a couple of bad seasons, you know, while he has his lumps if that means we can win a national championship. But like, imagine you're Brian Kelly and you're kind of, for less of a better term, like tanking, like just to take your lumps with the freshman quarterback. Like, well, I, I, tell, I, good luck telling Drew White that, you know. The 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 irony of the scenario is, um, okay, yeah throw this season out in the trash. This is a developmental year, et cetera. But like you might, if, unless this offensive line can fix itself, you might have a seven and five year with Cone. And like, you might be better off leaving the athlete in there at quarterback. And like, you might think it's a throwaway year, but you might find more success with them. And I, I just think, you know, they mentioned during the broadcast that like Buckner was a super highly rated lacrosse player. And he's like a scratch golfer. And, um, I assume he's probably a great student. Uh, like, there's people you've met him, Mike. Um, there's some people in life that are like exceptional. Those just good like, at so everything kids. They're just they're, good at. They're I mean, annoying. At I played. <laughs> I played with Jeff Samarja. I mean, Jeff Samarja yep. damn near won the Blitnikoff. I mean, one of the best receivers. And how fun was that season? You know, a 2005 season, and and then the guys made you know 80 million dollars playing pro, pro baseballs. Like, there's just there's people like that. Um, and if you have one on your roster, play them. Yeah. I'm not saying start them. I'm saying play them. All right. So, you know, we're about 52 minutes in. So we're, we're, we're wrapping down. Um, you know, folks, if you've got any more questions you want to ask, make sure you drop a super chat. Um, but kind of my, my last thing for you, and then we'll take a few questions. Um, kind of summarizing, what does Notre Dame need to do? Let's just say to cover the spread against Purdue, which is eight and a half. That's what it opened at. What does Notre Dame need to do to go kind of fix this thing a little bit and get a double digit win against Purdue? Score points. It's uh, to me, what's the over on that game, Mike? 
I'll have our crack staff look that up. Um, All right. Uh, so I would say you got to score points and probably create a couple turnovers. Um, and that's the other thing too. Like when you look at the Toledo game, we had three turnovers to their one. I think the the turnover ratio, the plus minus in modern day football is the, like time of possession really doesn't matter as much anymore. Whoever wins the turnover battle is, is huge. So we were, you know, minus two there. I'd like to see us, we dropped a pick. I think it was Cam Hart dropped a pick in the end zone. That probably would have been a pick six against Toledo. But uh, yeah, create some turnovers and uh, score a boatload of points is how you, we're going to cover. Now, I'm not sure if the line has changed or if the, this Yahoo app I have has just a different sports book. 11.5 Notre Dame favored at 59.5 is the over under. What would you yeah. bet on that, Mike? I would bet the over. Okay. And what was the line? 11 and a half. That's what my Yahoo app says. I could have sworn I saw Patrick Angle tweet. It was eight and a half. So I don't know if that's so, a... So, yeah, preseason. So I'll, I'll tell you, because I do bet sports, Mike. And I like to throw out fun parlays. So week one, I went five for six in a parlay. And the game that busted me out, uh, I was in Stanley, Idaho on my camping trip, was uh, Oregon State, Purdue. Because I thought that Purdue was like going to be one of the worst teams in college football this year. Uh, and then this weekend, I went seven of eight in a parlay. Oof. Uh, and the team that busted me out, Mike, Notre Dame. You you put Notre Dame minus 17? I did. And uh, it was like a $20 parlay. It would have won me. That was a $10 parlay. It would have won me over three grand. I send you those sometimes. You do. But it was Notre Dame busted you out. You won yeah. a crazy one not too long ago. Yeah, I like them. And my, all my buddies are like, just bet the individual games. I'm like, nah, I'd rather, you know. But uh, what was the question? So, yeah, how do, how do you beat Purdue? It's you got to score a lot of points, um, and and find some production. Some score more. a lot of points by by what? Fix, is it the offensive line? Like do they just need to fix that. I mean, receivers have still aside from Kevin Austin. We don't throw what? the ball to any. We don't throw the ball to, to anybody else other than Michael Mayer. Michael Mayer had what was it? I think 12, 12 targets against Florida State, and I don't know what the targets were against uh, Toledo. Seven. But he had Sorry. nine catches. 12. Uh, seven, seven receptions, 81 yards, two touchdowns on 12 targets. Austin targeted nine times, uh, four catches. Avery Davis uh, targeted five times, three catches. And Braden Lindsay, four targets, two catches, 33 yards. So I, I just feel like it's if you had to put a gun to my head and I'm imagining how that Purdue game would play out, it, to me it would be kind of like a boat race mixed with like backyard football. So we're just going to kind of throw the ball around the field. And like, you might say, okay, well, we're going to try and run the ball and, and, and get control of the game, but it hasn't been working thus far um, from a tr you know traditional run game sense. But yeah, that's what I would think. Just throw the ball around the yard, spray it around. Okay. Got a question here from B Holland 11 um, asking about the three man fronts. I mean, look, that's been like the biggest thing that Notre Dame fans are frustrated about. Well, outside the offensive line, but um, what's, like when this defense works, what what is happening? Is it just those aggressive plays are are hitting? Like, what, ex explain the three man fronts and why you know coaches like them. Yeah, and this is my take on it, right? Yeah, so please. You you play a three man front, and I'm going to say traditionally, but to me, you would play a three man front in a third and obvious situation. So third and obvious being it's third and eight plus, it's third and twelve, it's third and ten, right? So you have your three down linemen and then you have like Foskey in the box and you can bring people from all over the place. So th the idea is to just create some disruption and create some confusion in terms of like the offensive line, the opposing offensive line's protection scheme. So that's why you would do it. But then if you can check into a run, so just to like almost envision this, you've got three down linemen, you've got three linebackers, you could bring a rover, you could bring the wheel, you could bring a corner, you could bring whoever. But if they check to a run on that play, now I've got a, an open hole here and I have an open hole here. Whereas if there was a fourth guy with his hand in the ground, it would have closed up one of those gaps. And then you've got linebackers that are coming all different directions. And all it takes is for like that guard to just give him a flipper. And then we create a huge running scene. Sure. Um, that long touchdown run that Florida state had early in the game, you know, this is Shane Simon. It's your boy. Uh, dude. <laughs> And by the way, he has a uh, torn labrum. Right. And I played my entire junior season. I tore my labrum during fall or during summer, you know, during camp. And I played the whole season with it. And I never missed a, 
practice. But that's me and that's Shane Simon. So you can oh, play. Come on. You can play with a torn labrum. All those dudes, Mike, you see that wear that like black, uh, you know, kind of strap on their arm and it attaches underneath your pads. That's to keep your your arm from. Oof. So, but there's dudes playing with torn labrums. Believe me, it's doable. Um, but hopefully that explains the, uh, the, the, the three-man front. So the pro is you can give a lot of crazy looks and try and confuse an offensive line. Um, and then, but the, the con is, is you're super susceptible to long runs and just gaps being blown open and... If, if, if a corner slips in pass coverage, it's a touchdown. So that's just uh, – it's boom or bust. Yeah, I think I saw it was Pete Sampson that tweeted that Notre Dame, and, and I hope I'm getting this right. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. It's something like Notre Dame has allowed more 60-yard plays in two games than Clark. I saw Lee that tweet. Years. Like that is just mind-blowing. Um, yeah. And yeah, and, you, and like you go into – I mean, again, I remember going into games and you'd be like, all right, we're stopping the run. Like no matter like when when I was playing at Notre Dame, we had some pretty good defenses. We had horrible uh, s- secondaries, but like our front four was awesome. And it was like we are not giving up long runs. And it was all about your run fits. And it's hard to have a run fit if I'm coming on a blitz. Like if I'm crossing face and I'm coming on a blitz, it's like I'm going to give up that a gap. It's just it's hard. It's uh it's almost like when you're playing linebacker. We got to move on past this because I'll run on. But it's like. When you're playing inside linebacker on a third and obvious and they run a draw in a conventional scheme, it sucks being a middle linebacker because it's like you're caught. And now here comes that guard and here comes the ball behind him and I have to negotiate that block. When you're playing in a three, three-man three front, it's almost like that every single play. Sure, sure. All right, we got a question from the Blue and Gold message board. Pre-Till says, excellent job. And Mike and Mike, love to hear his thoughts on the defense. I'm not – a fan of the boomer bus using his terminology defense in college football today since explosive plays win games. I hope and believe Marcus Freeman will adapt partially because Brian Kelly will make him. Um, didn't Kelly mention in the post game, the defense needing to be simplified Yeah, It, it kind of seems like if you're reading in between the lines, Kelly's frustrated. Like, you know, he's like crap. Like I, I missed that defense from last year. I think, you know, we all kind of do um, any comments on, on pre tills post here. Uh, yeah, I, I would go back to what I mentioned earlier, and I was kind of a disjointed thought, but you can you can encourage your players to play with an aggressive approach and just, man, like make an aggressive mistake, right? If you're going to miss, miss aggressively, like come downhill. Like you've seen Bertrand. Bertrand's playing awesome, man. Uh, play like that so you can go into that game with that mindset, whereas maybe Clark Lee overcoached guys and made them like too cerebral. But, like, we're playing defense, okay? So you can keep Marcus Freeman's overall approach mentality to the game of football and maybe simplify the scheme and we don't have to be so cute on every single play. So if it's third and, again, nine, yeah, man, pull a magic crazy blitz out of your hat. But, like, on first and second down, especially against Wisconsin, Mike, I mean, Wisconsin ran for, like, 300 yards yesterday. I forget who they played, Eastern Michigan. If we come with this cute scheme and this complex dynamic scheme against Wisconsin, our first real test, we're going to get gashed. Hmm. We're going to get gashed. Like you got to line your guys up, put four hands in the dirt, and you got to play traditional football against a team like that, you know, an offense like that. All right, good stuff. Well, that's uh, that's Mike Goolsby. We're going to go ahead and wrap this thing up. Appreciate um, everyone who has joined us live and appreciate those who are watching back. Uh, we will have Mr. Goolsby on these YouTube shows, uh, hopefully most Sundays throughout the season. He is a very busy man, does a lot of traveling, but uh, we're, we really appreciate Mr. Goolsby's time. To, Good to uh, be back, so, buddy. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. So appreciate you guys. Make sure you hit that thumbs up. Go to blueandgold.com uh, for all of your Notre Dame football coverage.